Well, good morning. It is great to see you here at the Tabernacle, and if you're joining us online, we want to welcome you as well. In times like these, it's good to know that God's love will last forever. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to our feet and sing out to the Lord uh, the praise that is due His name. Two. particularly like that line in that song, by the grace of God, we will carry on whatever 2020 throws at us, right? Including now earthquakes uh, with a 5.1 hitting and uh, it being one of 20 in the last 24 hours. So apparently these, uh, this, something's happened here that continues on and rolling and stuff. So hopefully that's the biggest one and there's not more to come. But by the grace of God, we will carry on, right? Well, let's take a moment and celebrate our children's summer reading program. Let me report to you that 23 Tabernacle children read 1,319 books. So give them a round of applause for that. Let me ask the children who are here that read to uh, stand up, uh, if you will, now. And uh, around the room here, and many in the first service. So good for you guys. Okay, give them a round of applause. And... um, The overall team that had the highest number of books read was the Team Catfish, and Abigail Chivas read 493 books. Uh, Amazing. Uh, I also see, uh, I think, Colby back there. He read 84 books, Colby Morris, which is awesome. And uh, let's see, Keegan Morris read 99 books. Um, Trying to think of those that are in this room. Uh, Bethany Bain read 52 
That's great. The pains and other chivises were in the first service as well as Grace Heist. Uh, Isaiah Porterfield I see up there. He read seven books. Good job, Isaiah. All right. <laughs> Kayla was back there. She read ten. All right. And uh, I see Grace Balbin's here. Leah, they read some books. Pretty awesome. And uh, way to go, everybody. Good job. Now, if you're one of those children that read, what we want you to do is, after the service, go to the library. They want to take a picture of you to add to the picture of those that were in the first service. And excellent job. I want to let you know that volleyball is taking a break for now. So if you intended to come and play volleyball this Thursday, wait a couple months or however long it is till we get it going again. But wanted you to know about that. Next week, uh, uh, baptism at the 1015 service. If everyone is inter- anyone is interested in being baptized, talk to us this week. We'd love to have you obey the Lord through being immersed as a believer. Um, all right. Also, I want to let you know about something we're going to do the next three Sundays. Uh, it's between Sunday school and the service. I'm sorry, the first service and Sunday school, and then again between Sunday school and the second service. Uh, if you are not yet registered to vote, we are going to have April Fulcher at the Opportunity Desk, and you can go ahead and get registered to vote. Now listen, you cannot complain about anything that happens politically if you do not do your duty as a citizen, and at least a vote to go along with praying and engaging and things like that. And uh, you cannot, if you live in Danville, you can't say no to the casino issue uh, when that time comes. And you can't weigh in on all the other important elections that will happen. You know, when you vote for Congress or the House of Representatives, you're voting for one five-hundredth of the House. When you vote for Senate, you're voting for one one one-hundredth of the Senate. When you vote for President, you are voting for one-third of the entire government. Not just the person, whether you like him or not, that occupies the uh, White House, but you're voting for the one that will appoint all the directors of all the key departments that have incredible uh, things throughout our entire country and all that they do. They also, it's going to be their vice president that's going to break any tie in the Senate. And it's going to be also, um, they get to appoint all the federal court vacancies, including the Supreme Court. Incredibly important vote that you get to do. And it has to go beyond personalities to the issues and what the party platforms stand for and things like that. So, You need to educate yourself between now and the election, but if you don't register to vote, you can't do anything about it when that day comes. And So so go ahead and register to vote. We're going to help you do that 16th, 23rd, 30th uh, between the services at the Opportunity Desk over here. Remember that the 23rd, August 23rd, we're going to move the 815 start time back to 8. Sunday school from 915 to 9. The service at 1015 that you're in now, same usual time. Uh, Also, that's when we're going to start Sunday school back for all ages. And parents, you're going to be receiving a letter in the mail about uh, what you need to do to get ready for that. Uh, It goes without saying that during these times, and really, this would never not be true, if you feel sick or sick in any way, don't come. Now we've got live stream. You can watch online, right? Don't come and share your germs with others and things. But we have some specific things we want parents to do uh, to get their child ready to come. And we're going to do a temperature check here for the children under 18, too, uh, to make sure that everybody stays as safe as we can possibly uh, do there. Uh, but there's one other thing about safety, and that is because we now have uh, this first service and a second service with Sunday school in between, it means people are entering and leaving the property at different times, right? And what that means is we really need everyone to enter at the upper lot and exit at the lower lot. Because if you're coming in when somebody else is coming out, problem, right? And so enter at the upper lot, exit at the lower lot, and you don't have the predictable times now where uh, there might not be somebody exiting out when you're entering, taking the shortcut entering in. So we've been lax about that, but we need to be strong on that so that nobody gets hurt that away in addition to all the other crazy possibilities that are out there right now. Uh, I'm so thankful for partners and creative thinking. We had called the homecoming, uh, um, uh, for not homecoming, the triumphant quartet. We had called the triumphant quartet to figure out, you know, exactly how to best approach the concert that we had scheduled here for September 13th. And they had an idea, and we put our ideas together, and they actually volunteered to do a second time that day. So on the 13th, you've got a 3 o'clock option and a 6 o'clock option. You can come to either one of those. And we've got cards over there where you can invite others as well. 
Uh, and what we want to do for that concert is we're going to say a mask is required until you get seated. So in the door until you get seated and on the way out. So we just have that extra level of safety. And, of course, we want to spread out throughout the whole building uh, both of those times as well. But that's very exciting, them giving us that second option as well uh, because uh, where there's a will, there's a way, which is great. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your tremendous love for us and the truth of your word. Lord, we come to you now, Lord God, thankful that you meet us in moments like this, Lord God. And Lord, even today, we've had another curveball with uh, an earthquake. It didn't catch you by surprise. You told us that creation itself groans, longing for the redemption. And you told us that an increase of pestilences and earthquakes and things like that would be like a woman's birth pains that come closer together as it leads up to the time that you'll return, Lord God. And so, Lord, ready or not, here you come. Lord, I pray that everybody I speak to today is ready to meet you, Lord, through faith in you. And God, they uh, continually uh, are sober-minded and watchful during these days, God. We pray that as we get the gospel out, you'll continue to do what is the only reason really for the delay in your return so that more people can hear and be saved, God. Lord, we think about Beirut, Lebanon right now. What a beautiful country. What a beautiful city, sometimes called the Switzerland of the Middle East. Lebanon for years has been a place where Christian ministries have uh, launched out into ministry into other areas throughout the Middle East. It's also been a place that Iran and Turkey and others have interest in uh, using for nefarious means, God. It's a country torn, Lord, and literally has had a, a blast that uh, has torn apart part of the city, God. Lord, thank you for sovereignly placing uh, one of our brother SBCV pastors uh, who happens to be from Lebanon there, uh, back in Lebanon as this was happening, God. And I pray that you'd be with him as he ministers and as he stays a little bit longer than he intended to, to help with SBCV efforts there to meet needs and to get the gospel out. May there be an openness during this time in Lebanon to receiving you that wasn't previously present, Lord. Bring people to Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. to know that earthquakes don't take the Lord by surprise or COVID or death in the family or any sickness or illness that comes our way government situations world disasters through it all the Lord is not taken by surprise he's still on the throne and enables us to weather the storm isn't that good? I was challenged and encouraged by a dear brother in Christ, an evangelist that uh, um, has um, been a, such a blessing to me this past week, um, when he wrote that throughout the centuries, if you look at the Christians, the true Christians, he said, they have always weathered the storm. Always. Why? Because of him who resides in us. And we with them can say, yet not I, but through Christ in me. I love this new hymn that has been given to the church and, and maybe a little bit new for some of you. And so this is my exhortation as we sing it together because the Lord commands us to sing, doesn't he? Through all throughout the scriptures. So if you're one of those ones that uh, likes to be a bump on the log, you just can't because you'll be disobeying the Lord. So as you lift up your voice, aren't you glad that he says, make a joyful noise? But the command to sing is both vertical and horizontal, brothers and sisters. It's vertical because we're worshiping the Lord God and he is worthy of praise, amen? But it's horizontal because God tells us that as we're singing to one another, what's going on there? We're exhorting one another. We're singing the songs of the homeland. He's coming to take us home, amen? And as we look to that day, and it's soon, brothers and sisters, we're encouraging each other to keep on keeping on, weather the storm through Christ. Stand with me as we worship him.
trial or a pain he did not recycle to bring me gain I can't remember one single regret in serving God only and trusting Amen. Hey, if you are here and you've misplaced your keys to your Lincoln, see me after the service before I drive it home. <laughs> so, 
We have a missing set of Lincoln keys for those that want to claim them after the service. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 9. And as you turn there, let me ask you if you know about the Jewish holy day, Tisha B'Av, Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av. Av is one of those uh, Jewish, it's one of those Hebrew months that corresponds with our July and our August, July, August. And the ninth of Av is the ninth of that month. And it happened a couple weeks ago on July 29th, uh, but uh, last year was on August 10th, and so it corresponds with tomorrow as far as the time of year it is. The 9th of Av is when our Jewish friends commemorate the two destructions of the Jewish temple. The first was in 586 B.C. at the hands of the Babylonians in Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, The second time was by the Romans in A.D. 70. On that day, our Jewish friends, they will mourn and fast and pray the same way they would as when a loved one dies because of how keenly the loss is felt of not having the temple to go to like the Old Testament scriptures uh, call for among Jewish people. The prophet prophet Zechariah in chapter 8 verse 9 called it the fast of the fifth month. And Jews will go even now to what's left of the temple mount there, the western wall, and they will uh, pray and they will say, uh, they'll pray for the Messiah to come and for the temple to be rebuilt. And this feast is one of one time, this fast is one of three, sorry, one of three times during the year that they say to each other, next year in Jerusalem, next year we want the temple to be back and to be actually worshiping in Jerusalem. Something happened this year, talk about the fervor of the times we're in, something happened this year that hadn't happened since 1967. A Jewish young man was able to sneak an Israeli flag onto the temple mount that's controlled by the Turkish authorities there, uh, or the the, uh, the Lebanese authorities there, and he was able to raise that Israeli flag, and it hadn't happened since the war back in 1967, which was really powerful to a lot of people. But ironically, other notorious times of persecution have also corresponded to this ninth of Av day this Tisha B'Av. In A.D. 1290, all Jews were expelled from England on that day. A horror that they just kicked all the Jews out. In A.D. 1490, Spain launched its Inquisition on that day. Hundreds of thousands of Spanish Jews were told you need to convert to Catholicism or be burned at the stake. And those who remained faithful like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, faced the fire. In light of those things, the ninth of Av has become a symbol not just of the destruction of the temple uh, twice, but also for times of persecution and trouble for the Jewish people. It's a day to remember, to hope for the, the biblical promises that are in the Old Testament related to a future day of glory. Now, I bring all that up because we've been looking at the life of the Apostle Paul, who himself was a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, who at first was in violent opposition to his fellow Jews turning to Christ. He couldn't understand why any of his fellow Jews would embrace Jesus as the Messiah. And so he persecuted them. But then Jesus himself personally appeared to him on the road to Damascus, and Paul turned to Christ. Saul became Paul, and he himself became a Jesus follower from a Jewish background. Folks, as we've looked at the life of Paul... We've seen a historical fact from the first century. I mean, it's just in the pages of the text. After their conversion, Paul and other Jews who embraced Jesus were often the target of Jews who opposed other Jews coming to Christ. Paul himself says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 4 and 5, that five, on five occasions he received 39 lashes from the Jews. We're talking about the kind of lashes that rip flesh open, that leave permanent scars. It happened to Jesus once, right before he was crucified, when he was scourged, that kind of thing happened. It happened to Paul five times. Five times 40 would be 200, and that's just up to 2 Corinthians. If it happened after that, this man received over 200 lashes uh, for trying to get the message of Jesus out. He mentions three other times he was beaten with rods, which would be hard to endure also. And a time stones were actually thrown at him, hitting his body, and he was left for dead outside city gates. 
if anyone could have had uh, decided to be upset with his fellow Jews forever, it could have been Paul there, but that's not his heart. As we're going to see today, Paul never stopped loving his fellow Jews, and he would be mortified at all the anti-Semitic acts. When we talk about anti-Semitism, we're talking about Jews being mistreated throughout history simply because they are Jews. And they're being the satanic part of that because Satan hates God, so Satan hates God's chosen people, the Jews, right? And he hates Christians as well. Paul would reject all of that, especially those things done by professing Christians. And Paul believed in Israel's future, as we're going to see today. So turn, if you haven't yet, to Romans chapter 9. And we're going to read these first five verses. But we're going to point out that in the wonderful book of Romans, Paul took three chapters, chapters 9, 10, 11 to ask a question that uh, especially Gentile Christians, those from a non-Jewish background, would have had. And the question would be, well, what about Israel? Um, if now Jews and Gentiles are together supposed to work, uh, worship together in churches when they come to know Christ, what about Israel? Is there a future for the nation as a whole? And how is that parsed out? Paul's answer, and beautiful answer, is in chapters 9, 10, and 11, starting with these verses here in chapter 9. He says, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have mega sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ, cut off from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, that's the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. Paul believed in Israel's future. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what we've been learning as we've looked at the conversion and life of Paul. Thank you that he experienced things just like we do. No answers to prayer, that your grace is sufficient when things become part of our story that we don't necessarily want to be part of our story. Hostility when the name of Christ was borne out in word and deed throughout his travels, Lord God. And we thank you that we can ourselves take comfort that you have a purpose and plan for our lives, that you want to use our gifts, you want to use our talents, you want to use our church as we work together to advance your causes on earth, Lord God, to meet needs that are around us, to share the gospel with everyone we come in contact with. Thank you for Paul's intense love for all peoples to come to know Jesus Christ. Thank you for his especial heart as we look at today for his fellow people, his countrymen, those like him to come to know Christ, Lord. And each of us has loved ones that we want to have, see have a deeper walk with you and those that don't know you to come to salvation, God. Lord, thank you for the great truth that just as you have a future for Israel, and you're going to keep the promises that you've made throughout the Old Testament to Israel, Lord God. Thank you that that gives us all the more confidence that you'll keep the promises you've made to the church, Lord God, and Christians within the church. Lord, bless us as we look at these things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, last week we saw a little bit how, according to Acts, Paul had friends named Aquila and Priscilla who he met in Corinth. They were tent makers like he was. They uh, made and fixed tents, and they met in the marketplace there. They became instant friends. They started worshiping together and leading others to Christ together. They had a church in their home. But it says in Acts 18, their story was that they had actually been in Rome when the Jews were kicked out of Rome. And Acts 18, too, tells us that Emperor Claudius kicked all the Jews out of Rome at a moment in time. And it happened because there was Jewish unrest over Crestus. The Roman historian Suetonius tells us that the reason that happened was because they were fighting over somebody named Crestus, right? Which, of course, is Jesus Christ. There were Jews that didn't acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah. There were those coming to know Christ as Jesus, their Messiah. And the turmoil that was in Rome led the emperor to say, get them all out of the city. And we've already seen things like that were happening around the Roman Empire. So... By the time Paul writes this letter around A.D. 57, the Jewish Christians Priscilla and Aquila had returned to Rome. We see that at the end of this book, Romans 16. 
But the church still had questions about how the church should relate to Israel, and that's what Romans 9 through 11 is about. And it drips with uh, Paul's love for his fellow countrymen to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, to turn to the Messiah that had been promised to Israel, the Savior of the world, but the Messiah for Israel in fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises. But he also, during this section we're going to look at, shows intense thankfulness for God's work through Israel in the past. And he preaches the same thing that Jesus and the prophets did, that all of the promises, not some, but all of the promises made to Israel in the Old Testament would come to a time of fulfillment in the future. So first, let's look at verses 1 through 3. Paul's intense desire for his fellow Israelites to be saved. He says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow. The word there is mega. I have mega sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my Jewish countrymen, according to the flesh. I love those verses. It's as if Paul says, oh, I wish that you could just open up my heart like the Holy Spirit can and see what's inside of me. He said, I wish you could see the love I have for my countrymen. There you would find aching sorrow. You would find a continual grief. I'm constantly in sorrow. I'm sad. I'm grieving over the fact that more of them haven't turned to Christ as Savior and Lord, recognizing his rightful position as their Messiah. He had been right there with them before conversion. We've seen that, haven't we? He just didn't buy it. He said, you know, uh, there's one God, his name's Yahweh, and there's no way that uh, he has a son. And yet there are sprinkled verses in the Old Testament that had said that very thing. Let us create man in our image. Uh, Proverbs 30 that talks about who's this creator and who, what's his name? What's his son's name? Psalm 2 talks about worshiping the son lest he be angry and it's talking about the Messiah in that Psalm 2 and those things. The prophecies were that he'd be born in Bethlehem, that he would be, um, uh, that he'd be uh, born of a virgin, that he would minister in the Galilee region and beyond, that he would work miracles that hadn't been worked before, that um, he would die in this, as a substitute. All we like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has laid the iniquity of us all on him. There were two sets of prophecies about that Old Testament Messiah. One was that he'd be a suffering servant that would die in the sinner's place, like Isaiah 53 talks about. The other set was was that he would be a conquering king who would rule on the throne promised to David and the land promised to Abraham. And as they were oppressed by the Roman Empire, they wanted that part to happen now, and they'd kind of push to the side this other work that he had to do as the suffering servant. And so Paul and others were pleading with them. Paul had been right there with them persecuting, but when Paul came to Christ, he became one that pled for them to understand that Jesus really is the Messiah. The evidence is there. The prophecies have been fulfilled. The miracles back it up. The eyewitnesses who are willing to die for the faith back it up as well. And it was happening that he so desperately wanted them to be saved. He wanted his lost family members, his fellow Benjamites, his fellow Israelites from the other tribes to believe. He was tore up from the floor up whenever he thought about it. And he actually says, I could wish myself accursed from Christ for my brethren. Now understand the implications of what Paul is saying there. He is saying, I would trade places with them and I would go to hell for them if they could go to heaven instead. That's what he's saying. Now, Paul would not need to say that if just being a physical Jew meant you already had a ticket to heaven. But Romans 1 through 8 has brilliantly demonstrated the sinner's need of Christ, whether you're from a Jewish background or a Gentile background, and how. Jesus Christ has died in the sinner's place, whether Jew or Gentile, to bring a person to heaven instead of hell. Romans 3.23, right? All have sinned. All means all Jews, all Gentiles. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And verse 24 says, being justified freely. And it goes on to describe Christ's work for the sinners. But look at Romans 1.16 and 17. So keep a hand there in Romans 9. Go back to Romans 1. 16 and 17. I actually preached these two verses the very first time I ever spoke at the tabernacle. And Paul writes, I am not ashamed of the good news of Christ, the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. 
for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the ages change. The Old Testament age gives way to the New Testament age, and there's ages yet to come. But whatever age, faith is the key to salvation. Genesis 15, 6, it says, Abraham believed God and his faith was, faith was counted as righteousness. It was reckoned to him as righteousness. We call that justification by faith. And it was just as true for Old Testament saints as it is for New Testament saints. Before Christ came, Jews were saved by believing in God and the promises of his coming Messiah. They were looking forward to the time where he would do that work for sinners. Now we're looking back on what Christ has done for sinners and we place our faith in Jesus Christ for salvation whether we come from a Jewish background or a Gentile background. Paul had continual sorrow because even though many first century Jews had received Jesus, others rejected him. And we have that same sorrow today. Look at Romans 2, the end of the chapter. Romans 2 verses 28 and 29. Paul makes this explicitly clear when he says, He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Folks, that makes perfect sense when you look at the Old Testament its various generations, doesn't it? I think back to the time of Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Their names are in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11 for serving God by faith and and following him. But during that same generation, there were Jews like Korah and Dathan who tried to uh, take on uh, roles left for the priestly family. And what did the earth do? We had an earthquake today, Uh Um, uh-oh. The earth opened and swallowed them up. God judged them right there. They're not going to be in heaven. They had rejected God right? So you've got Moses, Aaron, Miriam, who are going to be in heaven, love the Lord. Then you think of Elijah's generation. Elijah and Elisha, they loved the Lord. They served him. And God told Elijah, listen, there are 7,000 people in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal. All those in that generation who worship Yahweh by faith, man, we're going to see them again later on. But what about all those who worship Baal instead? They rejected Yahweh. Well, a good number of them are going to be in hell. Hopefully some of them under Elijah's preaching and Elisha's too turned back to Yahweh or to Yahweh before it was too late. I think about Jeremiah's generation. He was preaching his heart out and we know that he had continual sorrow hoping that people would buy his message and believe his report. But so many didn't. There were false prophets like Shemaniah and others who will not be in the holy place, but instead will be in hell. From Paul's generation, there were those who received Christ. They're going to go to heaven. There's those who rejected Christ, and they'll be in hell. And the same thing is true in the year 2020. As Acts 4 explicitly says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And Paul knew that many were hearing about Jesus and rejecting him. And... Many were from among his own community, fellow Jews, and he was brokenhearted about it. Just as I hope you're brokenhearted about your lost loved ones, those you know and love who don't know Christ who reject him. Hope you're brokenhearted about your community, people who openly defy and reject Jesus Christ. The good news is Paul did that one day, heard the gospel and was saved, and lived a different reality after that, right? And so this is very intense. Now, Paul was willing, we're told here, to trade his place. If he could, he would trade his secure place in heaven so that his fellow countrymen could be saved instead of being on the highway to hell. And some of you would do that for your lost loved ones. You would. You would trade places with them. But we can't do it either, can we? And the sad reality is that if we could, we could just do it for one person. If God allowed Paul in his heart there to make that trade, it could only be for one. It could not be for more than one person because it's a life for a life. A person in the Old Testament had to bring a sacrificial lamb, right? And the lamb covered and atoned their sin temporarily, looking forward to God's future promise. But another person had to bring another lamb right? You had to bring your own one for one, a life for life. And it wasn't that God was into killing animals in the Old Testament times. It was to show Israel and all of us the value of each human life, this one-to-one thing. So 
even if we have the heart to do it, we can't take anybody else's place. First of all, we're not perfect enough to, right? Because we've got the same problem they do. We're living the same reality. But that's, of course, where the wonderful gospel comes in. Somebody has taken the place of guilty sinners. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And on the cross, those who receive what he did for them, God's perfect uh, love and justice intersect. The wrath due our sins is dealt with on the cross. And when we receive him, the love due Jesus from God the Father is funneled into our heart and our lives as if we were his own son. And we are children by faith in Christ. Now, that didn't end the story. That's just where Paul began. Because the rest of chapters 9, 10, and 11, he's trying to build into Gentile Christians. And let's get this clear. Because the Jewish Christians had been expelled from Rome, they were still slowly going back to Rome when Paul writes in AD 57. But the church is Gentile heavy at that point. Some churches around then had more Jews than Gentiles. This particular church had more Gentiles around. And so they needed to be taught, what about Israel? And of course, we need to be taught, what about Israel today afresh? And go back over the scriptures that are in the Old and the New Testaments that related to these things. So... In verses 4 and 5, Paul shows his desire for Gentile Christians to appreciate Israel's role. After everything he taught in the book of Romans so far, look what he says in verse 4. These are the Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, the Messiah came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Did you catch that? He ends up by saying Christ is the eternal God. So that's one verse you can add to your toolkit there along with John 1, 1 through 3 and many other verses that say Jesus Christ is God, the eternal God. Amen? So over lunchtime, you may want to go back into verse 4 and 5 and talk about the different things related to each of these sweet words. He says, hey, Gentile Christians, I want you to appreciate where you came from. I want you to appreciate the root of your faith, where your faith comes from, all those wonderful things that we see in the pages of the Old Testament. I want you to appreciate that God adopted Israel. They are his elect nation in a way no other nation is elect. He goes on to say, Jacob have I chosen, Esau have I rejected. Now, when you look in history... There are individuals among the Esau, Esauites, the Edomites, who actually turned to and trusted the Lord, right? So it's not a wholesale rejection of all those people. What he's doing is promoting the idea that Israel has a special role that no other nation has. There's an adoption there. They're elect in a way that no other nation is, not America, not uh, Edomites, not anybody else that's ever been around in history. Then he talks about the glory. What other nation got to see the Ten Commandments being given to Moses who brought them down from the mountain and the whole earth was, the whole mountain was filled with the glory. They couldn't even get close to it. When the tabernacle was dedicated and the temple was dedicated, God's glory filled that place. Uh, in his stamp of approval on what they were doing to worship him. And, and they couldn't even go inside. The glory was so thick. The Shekinah glory. Just the manifestation of his presence. That uh, Peter and Paul. Uh, I'm sorry. Peter and James and John got a small taste of when they saw the Lord transfigured before their very eyes. To them belongs the covenants. Oh, the Abrahamic covenant all the way back to Genesis 12. Where God promised that this people were not only chosen by God. But they would be a blessed nation, a great nation, that they would have the boundaries of the promised land and that through the seed of Abraham would come the Messiah who would bless the entire world uh, and what God would do through that. Oh, the Mosaic Covenant. Now, the Abrahamic Covenant, it was unconditional. God says, I'm going to do this, period. But the Mosaic Covenant was conditional. It was kind of that parentheses time. When we talk about the new covenant that we're under now, it's in contrast to the Mosaic covenant that had clear uh, rules for Israel, right? And under the Mosaic covenant, you were blessed if you obeyed, you were cursed if you disobeyed. It didn't mean you ceased to be a Israelite or that you couldn't repent and bring the sacrifice and get back on track with God. The law told them, about God's character, it told them what God expected, and it also drove them because they didn't measure up to realize their need of the Messiah to come. The Davidic covenant was another great covenant. It was unconditional in the sense that God promised David, your son, the Messiah, is going to sit on the throne promised to you 
in the land promised to Abraham, and there will be a golden age unlike the world has ever known where Jesus or the Messiah to come will rule literally from Jerusalem for at least a thousand years. And so all those, the covenants that were there. He talks about the law. The law had three parts, didn't it? The moral law, the timeless truth about what God is like. And everything God expects of us was repeated in the pages of the New Testament. That's how you know it's moral law. So lying is always wrong. Adultery is always wrong. Uh, stealing is always wrong. We're always to lift up the name and not uh, take the name in vain, you know, in those different things and aspects of it. There was also the priestly law. All that uh, the Messiah would do for sinners to come was modeled in the sacrifices that Israel was to bring. So they brought a Passover sacrifice. Christ is our perfect sacrifice. They were told to observe the year of Jubilee. Christ is our freedom. And it goes on and on from there. All of those are types to which Christ is the fulfillment. Then there was the civil law. Rules just for Israel, probably meant to be just until the Messiah came. You know, when you're building a building, you need scaffolding. Israel had its civil law. Penalties built in to, uh, so that they would be on the right track until the Messiah came. Once you build the building, the scaffolding is no longer necessary. The analogy Paul uses in Galatians is like a guardian. Your guardian takes care of your legal requirements until you're 18, and then it's you after that, right? And Paul says the law was our tutor. It was our guardian to lead us to Christ. Now that Christ has come, we don't need that civil law aspect, that guardianship that that part of the law had. It fell away. And that's the part that said don't eat shellfish, don't eat uh, um, you know, pork and those type things. They hardly could have gone through the desert for 40 years on a shellfish and pork diet, you know, and some of us could stand to apply a few of those things today, although we're not required to, which is great when you have that barbecue sandwich. <laughs> the service of God related to all the things they did at the tabernacle and the temple with those sacrifices, the special feasts, and then he goes into the promises, particularly the promises of this Messiah to come that is given as early as Genesis 3 and just keeps building throughout the pages of the Old Testament, so much so that uh, people were already exclaiming when Jesus was here, this is the Messiah, this has to be the Messiah. Uh, the miracles that the Messiah is supposed to work, this guy's doing. He's fulfilling prophecies, that, and, and they just were falling into place time and time again. And as he rose from the dead, the ultimate miracle, and as his name was preached, Jews and Gentiles alike said, that's the Messiah of Israel. That's the Savior of the world. And I love how Paul brings it home. Through Israel, the Christ came in the flesh, the Christ who is over all, the Christ who's the eternally blessed God. And if Paul could do it, that's when he would have dropped the mic, right? He says, man, remember that everything you love and appreciate about Christ came through the nation of Israel. Paul goes on in Romans 11, 11 through 29, turn there, to reject the idea that Israel's been replaced by the church. So let's just take a few minutes and go down through that. Verse 11, he says, I say then, have they, meaning Israel, stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. In other words, there is a future hope. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. We're in a parentheses of time now, what we call the church age, where the gospel's getting to the nations. Daniel chapter 9 anticipates that happening. It talks about a final seven years before Christ returns in which God will be amazingly at work uh, to bring all the Jewish people in so that he can have his kingdom on earth. But there's a parentheses before that starts. I'll explain it in a minute, but Paul's talking about it here, isn't he? He says... But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. If their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. So they're going to see that this gospel is flourishing among the Gentiles. They're going to reconsider the claims that Jesus is the Messiah, and they're going to want in. Verse 15, for if they're being cast away as the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So he said, yes, there's a temporary rejection going on now among Israelites, but God is going to be bringing in Gentiles during this time. He refers to it four or five different ways uh, as he goes through this. 
Verse 17, and if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the tree, do not boast against the branches. Hey, you Gentile Christians, don't boast against the Jewish Christians. We get it and they don't. Ha ha, we, we, we replace them. No, Paul, Paul doesn't allow for that here. He doesn't apply, allow for that. He says, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. That's in verse 18. You might want to asterisk that or underline it or circle it. You do not support the root. The root supports you. Christians are always to remember where they came from, the Old Testament, deep roots of their faith, how that came out of Israel and its people. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. You know what he's saying there? Hey, listen, if Israel can lose the promises made to them, you can lose the promises you, God made to you. But that's not the case. That's what's being rejected here by Paul. Verse 22, Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Now go to verse 25. He brings it home here. Listen to what he says. For I desire, do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. What's the mystery? It's the church age we're in now, the gospel being shared with the entire world before God revisits all those prophecies, all those promises in the tribulation time and then the second coming of Christ. Lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved after this time of the fullness of the Gentiles. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are what? Irrevocable. The promises God made to Israel are irrevocable. They will all come to place. And the promises God makes to all of us in the name of Jesus about turning to him and receiving salvation are irrevocable. Isn't that great news? Our God is the ultimate promise keeper. And here he says that, listen, in the past... Those who did not believe will be dealt with in judgment. But there was always those who believed. And the full number from all the planet, Jew and Gentile, that will believe and turn to Christ by faith will happen. And we're specifically told that at the end times, the time of the tribulation, the second coming of Christ, uh, there will be a massive turning of our Jewish friends to Christ. And it will be uh, the complete number that God has in mind to do that with. And then Christ will reign on earth for a thousand years. Now, many of us, including me, believe the rapture of God's church will be before that time of tribulation begins, as promised in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. You see Revelation really unfold wonderfully this way. And if you haven't got the devotional we did through the book of Revelation, there's copies of it over here of that promised wonderful time and how it unfolds that God will be bringing back his people in. Some of that's already happening as they're back in the land. There's uh, places that, are, that used to be wilderness and desert are now beautifully flowery and fruitful and stuff like that. And promises in Ezekiel and other books are coming to pass as God's people are being regathered. But there's going to be this massive turning to Christ. Well, one more thing before we uh, bring this to a conclusion. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, Paul was in, in essence teaching there in Romans 9 through 11 what Jesus had made clear right before he went to heaven. So he's risen from the, he's died for their sins, he's risen from the dead, and uh, he's teaching his disciples and he's about to go back, ascend back to heaven. And he, uh, they, they come to him in verse 6 and look what they ask him. They say, therefore... When they had come together, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Remember, two sets of prophecies, right? They had seen him fulfill the suffering servant prophecies, but all those conquering king prophecies were still out there. The Messiah ruling on the throne promised David in the land promised to Abraham. Now, there are a whole bunch of theologians out there, and it's a very popular theology these days, that says, forget about that for Israel. 
Forget about any future hope for Israel. The church has replaced Israel. In fact, you know, over in Denmark, they just did a Bible translation. And you know what they did? They took out all but 60 references to Israel in the whole book. Uh, they talked about the people of the Jews or something like that in those texts instead of it explicitly saying. And that has behind it, uh, let's be charitable and say it didn't have anti-Semitism behind all those. We're always worried about that. But it probably had replacement theology behind it. They know that it's confusing for people from that theology to look at the Old Testament, and they're constantly looking for the church in the pages of the Old Testament. I don't look for the church in the Old Testament. It's not there. That was that dispensational age when God was working through Israel to bring us to the time we're in now where the Messiah has come for all peoples. We are in the church age now, and we don't want to get them confused. That's why when you look at uh, Israel defending itself in the Old Testament pages or taking up arms or whatever, we don't need to use those verses to talk about that for us, right? Um, and so there's no call in the name of Jesus to go out and take up weapons. It doesn't work that way. We're explicitly told the opposite of that uh, in the great pages of the New Testament. But they said, Lord, at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Now, if replacement theology was right and we're supposed to forget Israel and just think about the church, this would have been the time for Jesus to say, Whoo, you guys, you got it all wrong. You got it all wrong, fellas. Whenever you see that Israel, now just put church in there instead, you know. Um, but Jesus did not do that. In fact, he tells them, basically, that time's going to come, and he tells them what to do in the meantime. Look how he says it. He said to them, verse 7, It's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. He says, hey, all those promises are going to come in. That's what Paul said, right? Until the fullness of the time comes in, then all Israel will be saved. It's coming. He says, but you shall receive power when this Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. Mm. Jesus' words help us understand that the age we're in now is the age of witness when we tell Jews and Gentiles alike about Jesus, imploring them to be saved. Three conclusions from Jesus' words in Acts 1 and Paul's in Romans 9 through 11. First of all, Christians should reject replacement theology that replaces Israel with the church. We believe that God will keep his literal promises to Israel. We believe that's what Paul taught. Secondly, Christians should reject all anti-Semitism in the world and promote the welfare of the often persecuted Jewish people. And it's happening now at an alarming rate around the world. It's on the uptick again, not the downtick. Things like COVID give opportunities for people to be distracted. And every time that happens, Christians get persecuted and Jews get persecuted. And it's happening around the world right now. There are two or 300,000 Jews in France. It's the climate there is so poor for them right now, they're about to move to Israel. And the tabernacle in the past has helped people make aliyah from places around the world, the flight home, the journey home to relocate to Israel, bringing some of that Ezekiel passage to life. And uh, we have been about that as a church, haven't we? We're among the top five givers uh, over time to the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, helping minister and love our Jewish friends in the name of Christ without asking any questions. And it has been a glorious part of the reasons God has blessed us over the years. The third conclusion is we should continue to share the good news that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world and that all who trust in him will be saved. We also budget a generous amount every month to the Friends of Israel. And the Friends of Israel, in addition to those helps ministries around the world for Jewish folk, also shares the gospel around the world and on college campuses. And every year leads many Jews to Jesus, which is a powerful thing, just like Paul did in his day. As he continued to share boldly, he saw Jews saved, he saw Gentiles saved. And this is the age now where we want to get the gospel to all peoples. Amen? So those are our conclusions from the heart of Paul and what he writes in Romans 9 through 11. Will you bow your heads? Let me encourage all that, are, that know they're Christians today in the sound of my hearing to remember that we don't support the root, the root supports us. We have a glorious heritage when we think about all uh, the wonderful and tremendous things about Israel from the Old Testament and all the promises God has, past, present, and future for that dear elect people of God. And Lord, 
as we come to you in prayer, we are mindful that many times professing Christians have gotten it wrong in relationship to Israel. I think about especially all the tie-ins with state churches and when there's totalitarian regimes and when there's state churches many times there has been an attempt to force conversion and that's never a good idea never works it's counterproductive and leads to legacies of mistrust suspicion and hurt lots of hurt lots of pain Lord, I thank you for the work of our friends, the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, Lord God. Rabbi Eckstein, we think about the great organization that he founded and has done so much good among Jews around the world. Lord, continue to bless that great organization. Thank you that we've had the opportunity to partner with them in many ways. Thank you for the friends of Israel and Jews for Jesus and others that do that help but also share the gospel, Lord God. How powerful that is. Lord, we're not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel tells us that God loves us despite our sins. Whatever our ethnicity is, Jew or Gentile, Jew or non-Jew, we're so thankful for John 3.16 that you love the world so much. You sent the Messiah. You sent your son Jesus that if anybody in this room turns to Jesus, they'll have eternal life. Lord God, I pray that if there's anyone here who has not received you personally, Lord, they'd come up to me after the service here and make their peace with God. Or if they're watching on the live stream that this week, they'd reach out to us and we'd be able to share the rest of the story. Lord, we love you. As our people depart, Lord, keep us safe, whatever we face next. But keep us courageous too, Lord God. Help us not to shrink back and be silent when we need to speak up for you and your love. In Christ's name we pray.